right. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome today to the IP Brown Bag Showcase Series for March. Um, it's customary to do the acknowledgement of country first and in recognition of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, spiritual connection to country, and in continuing ACU's commitment to reconciliation, we like to acknowledge country as we pass through. Today, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the First Peoples, the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways. We thank them for their continued custodianship. We acknowledge and celebrate the continuation of a living culture that has a unique role in this region. We also acknowledge elders past and present and thank them for their wisdom and guidance as we walk in their footsteps. So I'd like again to welcome everyone uh, both here and abroad uh, to this March uh, session. And of course, today's speaker is Professor Herb Marsh, who needs, who needs no introduction, but I'll let him introduce himself. Thank you. So I will swap over. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so there's just a few bio background to introduce me, but I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is that uh, for more than 25 years now, I've been the director of the uh, self uh, research center, the International Self Research Center, with all our international conferences and our monograph series. And uh, early on, there was a, a, a publicity photo taken of me uh, for that. And uh, just as an interesting thing, last year I tried to reproduce. That actually found the same shirt. So that's uh, me at the beginning itself and uh, current itself. But let me go ahead and move on. Now, uh, let's see. Why isn't that working? Uh, okay. okay. Did you do that or did I? I did that back when. All right. Okay. Um, so most of you have a PhD and a master's degree, and what you might ask, why would I uh, want to uh, show that? Well, as a matter of fact, you can see uh, how many people have uh, testomas signed by Ronald Reagan. And are you doing this or am I? Yeah. yeah. And uh, Ronald uh, and, and Arnold Schwarzenegger. So only in Los Angeles did you see a light. Uh, I actually know and met and had breakfast a number of times with Arnie uh, before he was a movie star, but never met Ronald Reagan. Okay, well, let me go ahead and move on to my uh, major presentation. And I want to acknowledge the existence of uh, Roberto Parada. Rhonda Craven, John Marshall Reed, and a whole boat, host of other people that uh, have helped me in this research over time. Uh, I probably don't need to tell you that bullying is a significant problem, uh, but there's also significant problems in the research of bullying. Uh, uh, so some of the contributions I'll talk about today are developing stronger measures of uh, victimization and bullying, uh, related, relating them to a host of uh, student characteristics and psychosocial variables, uh, implementation of an anti, uh, uh, classroom climate anti-bullying intervention that actually works. The intervention is based upon uh, self-determination theory and autonomy uh, support teaching, and also looking at cross-national generalizing some of the issues. So let me begin by talking about what bullying are, uh, what, the, what it is, and these are kind of the characteristics of bullying. The major ones are it's uh, seen as a harmful action by the predator, it's a power imbalance, and typically it's repetitive. Now uh, there's a whole issue in terms of how literal these uh, definitional criteria need to be taken before it's considered bullying. One of the issues is that bullying researchers are kind of precious and they really want to differentiate their area of research from uh, uh, victimization and violence research more generally. And also victimization researchers typically oftentimes are separate from bullying researchers. So there's a lot of uh, ivory towers 
Okay, so uh, one of the issues that I looked at, there's some serious me uh, measurement problems. There's a historical tendency to classify students as either bullies or addictive, that is, that they're uh, mutually exclusive. Uh, and there's an implicit assumption that bullying and victimization are ends of a bipolar uh, uh, scale. Now, a bipolar scale would imply that the correlation between them is approaching minus one. And in fact, the correlation is positive. The po correlation is around 0.3. So this is a real issue in terms of theoretical issues in bullying and victimization. Victimization is clearly a multi-dimensional construct with multiple components, the standard ones being physical, verbal, and relational. Uh, uh, with Roberta, we developed uh, uh, instruments uh, and we're able to show that we can measure uh, with good reliability and good factor structure six different uh, factors, uh, verbal, social, physical, or bullying, and victimization. Now, what I'll consider in some of the research is what these are related to uh, and the patterns of relationship. Now, the patterns of relationship provide support for the construct validity of the bully and victim factors. They also provide insight into uh, the nature of these constructs, and they're also the basis for developing uh, interventions. The important theme of our research is that there are a lot of similarities between victims and bullies, and so we'll evaluate this uh, proposal in relation to other constructs. Now, one of the most widely looked at uh, uh, individual different variables is gender. Uh, and you can see from these graphs that uh, girls have much lower physical bullying and victim scores, moderately lower verbal bullying and victim scores, and they actually have, they don't differ much from boys in terms of uh, the social relational component. There are some age differences, uh, but the gender differences mostly don't interact very much with, uh, with age. And there's some issue, there's some issue of, uh, of, of non-linear relationships, uh, depending upon which factors you're looking at, particularly the victimization that tends to uh, uh, level out. Uh, sorry, you decline toward the end of high school. Now, let me move on to some. We need new batteries. Try that. Okay, I got a lot of clicks. Are you having the click on all these? Okay, so uh, we'll start off with looking at uh, uh, attitudes. This is a really important one. Now, unlike the uh, bully victim factors, the pro bully and pro-victim attitudes are substantially natively correlated around minus 0.5. So they're not bipolar, but they're clearly uh, quite different. The pattern of relationships uh, generally support our expectations, but there were a few surprising. Not surprisingly, bullying was strongly related to uh, endorsing pro-bully attitude, negatively related to pro-victim attitude. More surprising were the victim scores. Victims had a similar, although weaker, pattern of relation. Victim factors were weakly but positively related to pull a pro bully attitude and nearly unrelated to pro victim attitudes. The lack of pro victim attitudes by victims suggests the negative feelings that victims have for themselves. Victims tend to identify with bullets more than other victims. So there are some surprises there. So here we're looking. At, uh, at bystander roles, and this has become an important aspect in some of the intervention research that we're looking at now. Uh, bullies were substantially bullies were substantially more uh, likely to reinforce the bully to actively and passively encourage bullying behavior. Uh, they were less likely to ignore the situation, and particularly less likely to advocate for the victim. So that's not surprising. However, the pattern of results for the victim factors was somewhat, somewhat surprising and disturbing. Uh, so victims were more likely to uh, uh, take an active role, uh, and they were unlikely to uh, uh, advocate for the victims or to ignore the situation. 
So victims, even the victims who were bystanders in a situation where they weren't being victimized, were uh, likely to join in, particularly from the physical blame. Hence, victims are more likely to be active or passive reinforcers of the bullying than uh, reinforcing uh, or advocating for the victim. Okay, let's move to coping styles. Uh, this is important uh, measures. Uh, it's important to note that these are coping styles in general. They're not coping particularly in relation to the bullying situation. Bullies are more likely to use avoidance coping strategy, uh, less likely to problem solve or seek active support. Victims are even more likely to use avoidance than bullies, and victimization is almost unrelated to problem solving and seeking social support. So bullies and victims tend to have surprisingly similar in relation to coping styles. Now here I'm looking at expressions of anger. Uh, uh, here there's clear difference. Bullies are much more likely to deal with anger by externalizing it, and victims are more likely to internalize their anger and feelings. Those are not surprisingly and somewhat different. Um, there's a substantial body of research that shows that uh, uh, blame is, re is related to depression. Our results, uh, however, indicate that both bullies and victims report depressed and affect, although uh, victims to a much greater extent. Now, how do bullies and victims do about themselves? The effects are most negative, but uh, mostly the effects are negative. So both the uh, bullies and victims mostly have negative self-concept, but there are some that are close to zero for the bullies. The two physical skills and the two social skills and also emotional stability are all pretty close to zero. Interestingly, local self-esteem is similarly negative for both bullies and victims. Yet, neither bullies nor victims have particularly good uh, self-concept. Despite the general native correlation for both bullying and victim, there are some clear distinctions. The bullies have higher opposite sex relationship self-concept. They see themselves as popular with the opposite sex. For bullies, the most negative differences are the honesty, trustworthy, and sort of a moral self-concept and parent relationship. This suggests that bullies know that they are not doing the right thing. For victims, the most negative areas self-concept is same-sex relationships. Bullying is typically uh, by same-sex peers. Victims also fear, fear worse than bullies in terms of emotional stability self-concept, which is consistent with the depression effects that we looked at earlier. So in summary, bullies and victims have self-concepts that are below average in most areas. Again, although there are qualitative differences between bullies and victims, the results suggest that there are some uh, similarities between the two groups. Uh, yeah, oh, isn't it good that I've got a minder? Try clicking. Okay. Um, so the results have showed that bullying victims are positive. Bullying and victimization are positively correlated. Bullies and victims are more similar than different on many psychosocial outcomes. They're different from other people who are neither bullies nor victims. Our reciprocal effects model shows. Okay, the reciprocal effects model that I'm going to talk about in a minute will show that being a bully leads to being a victim. Da, 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 da. So let me go on and talk about what I'm summarizing. Uh, so we're going to talk about the development of bullies and victims over time. So thus far, we've looked at cross sectional data from a single point in time. Now we're going to move to more complex issues that evaluate dynamic changes uh, over longitudinal factors. Interesting. Okay, uh, we hypothesize that bullying and victimization are mutually reinforcing constructs, not mutually exclusive. These are uh, so it's appropriate to require longitudinal models. An important theoretical issue for practical implication is why bullies and victims are positively correlated when many people would uh, think that they're negatively correlated. Uh, these also have important implications for treatment and intervention. 
Okay, so testing causal hypotheses of this type at a min requires at a minimum uh, longitudinal models in which the same constructs are measured on multiple occasions. Of particular interest, we ask, do today's bullies Do uh, today's bullies become victims of the future, the red lines, and do victims uh, uh, become bullies in the future, the blue lines? The bully victim, uh, the bully victim factors are positively correlated and stable over time. Uh, however, there's a pattern of reciprocal effects. Prior bullying leads to subsequent being a victim, and being a victim uh, previously leads to subsequently being a bully. So being a bully leads to being a victim and vice versa. In summary, bullies become victims and victims become bullies. Consistently across, uh, so here we look at causal ordering uh, over a longer period of time and uh, looking at the issue of depression. Uh, it's oftentimes assumed that depression is an outcome of being victimized. Uh, we saw earlier that it's correlated with both being a victim and a bully. Uh, so here I'm looking at the causal ordering. Uh, consistently across the multiple ways that were reciprocal effects between the bully and victim factors, each had predictive effect on the other, such that bully became victim. So that's replicating what we already found. However, whereas depression had a positive predictive effect on subsequent victim factors, victim factors had no subsequent uh, depression effect uh, after controlling for prior outcomes. So the effect was unidirectional from depression to, uh, to victimization, not victimization to uh, depression. So there were no reciprocal effects relating bully, uh, uh, bully and victimization to subsequent depression. These results suggest that depression is a selection factor that leads to being a victim but that being a victim has little or no effect on subsequent depression beyond that was, was explained by pre-existing depression. This has profound equity issues and it's likely to have uh, a big difference in the bias of who's being targeted. So uh, expanding on this, we're now suggesting that the selection of who gets targeted are vulnerable people. Uh, depression obviously being a marker of vulnerable people. Uh, so this has profound equity sorts of issues in terms of uh, uh, all sorts of individual variables, SNS, uh, uh, disadvantage, uh, people that are different, people that are different and feel vulnerable because of it are likely to be uh, uh, targets of bullying. We also have what I refer to as the victim uh, paradox. These effects are the effects for victimized students are positively related to pro bully attitudes, negatively related to pro victim attitudes. Victims adopt the active reinforcing role for, uh, for uh, reinforcing the bully and even become bullies in the future. So uh, these are so counterintuitive as they want to label the victim paradox. Some of our recent work is looking at the cross-national generalizability, uh, working particularly with PISA data. And I'll refer to WEIRD as Western Education Industrialized Rich and Democratic <coughs> Countries. Now, the issue <coughs> with this is that almost all bullying research, and certainly the bullying uh, reviews and the meta-analysis are almost all based on WEIRD countries, particularly uh, uh, United States and a few OECD countries. So there's almost no basis for generalizability, cross-national generalizability. And so that's a really interesting issue. Meta-analysis claims to look at generalizability, but if all the studies are from one or two countries, then they're certainly not looking at universality uh, type of uh, generalizability. So with the OECD data, uh, uh, reported uh, victimization is systematically related to positive and negative mental health outcomes. And here's some of the, what some of them are. We extended this analysis to look at different components of victimization. Well-being uh, was most strongly related to relational uh, bullying and least related 
related to physical bullying. This is important because public perception policy and even some intervention focus substantially on physical victimization. However, relational victimization is much more detrimental to well-being and mental health. Uh, particularly interesting here was the issue of belonging, uh, which has the largest negative effect of any of the outcomes. Way uh, uh, the effect, particularly of relational bullying, on uh, sense of belonging is quite substantially higher than any of the other negative effects. Um, okay, so uh, uh, we can't look at this in detail. Obviously, you can't read it, but this was the uh, uh, 70 some countries that were in Pisa uh, 2018, and uh, the red uh, indicators are the OECD countries or the non-OECD country. And you can see that there are differences. OECD have uh, countries, developed countries have left bullying than the non-OECD country. And they also have a uh, more positive uh, attitude. But you can also see that within each of these groups, there's lots of variation. So the one I've highlighted there is Australia, which is more or less average in terms of the physical component a little bit below average and verbal and uh, relational and slightly better than average uh, anti uh, bullying attitude. But there are uh, there are countries uh, that have much better than are OECD countries, but there's also some that have worse. And even within the non OECD countries, there's some that have uh, relatively little bullying. This is China, interestingly. And there's some, this is the Philippines, where the bullying is quite substantial. So there's huge cross-national uh, uh, differences, but many of the uh, relationships are uh, cross-national generalizability. Gender differences that are interesting in OECD and non-OECD countries. Uh, uh, what we reported was that boys reported experience more physical victimization and effect size of around 0.3 and slightly more verbal uh, uh, relational uh, victim uh, uh, verbal victimization, but the gender differences and relational victimization were almost uh, were almost zero. Uh, what we found that was quite interesting was that. Uh, this hasn't actually been looked at previously because the few studies that have looked at uh, uh, bullying cross-national variation only looked at, uh, uh, at global scores. So this differentiation between different scores uh, uh, was somewhat unique to our study. Uh, okay, so here I'm, I can go Going down and looking at this a little bit, we found boys uh, report more physical and to a lesser extent verbal victimization. The differences are small for relational. Uh, critically, OECD gender interactions are significant for all three components. The largest is for relational. Uh, girls have more physical and verbal victims. victimization, uh, but the differences are larger in the non OECD countries. However, relational victimization is significantly higher for girls and boys in OECD countries, but significantly higher for boys and girls in not OECD countries. Interesting to speculate why that might be the case, but that's beyond what I can do today. Uh, however, the largest difference uh, gender differences are for girls' anti bullying attitude. Anti bullying attitudes are substantially stronger in OECD countries and stronger for girls. Nevertheless, gender differences. Uh, were larger in OECD countries and not OECD countries. Here I'm looking at some interesting uh, country level uh, variables. So uh, I'm looking, the first one is uh, national development. Uh, these uh, countries that have higher levels of development uh, have substantially stronger anti bullying attitudes. Uh, here we looked at 
uh, some negative indices of uh, country level uh, indices. And there were some relationships, but they, they were particularly strong with the uh, pro bully uh, uh, attitudes, uh, less strong for the uh, the other for the victimizations, and not significantly related to uh, the verbal. Uh, what was quite interesting was that OECD did a survey of countries looking at how strong an anti-bullying policy framework there was in each country. And this is something that everybody says is an important aspect. Every school should have an anti-bullying policy and so on and so forth. So this is critical. But uh, you can see that uh, the framework was essentially unrelated, was non significantly related to victimization. It was related to pro bully attitudes. Uh, so countries that had a stronger framework had more pro bully attitudes, but it wasn't actually related at all to the actual victimization. Now, what's interesting is that there are some other studies that have done, been done within single countries where they had much more detailed school by school analysis of the pro bully attitude, but they also found similar results of the pro, uh, that the policy didn't have all that much of an effect. Now, let me just read briefly on to talk about uh, some of our interventions. And this is probably the most exciting bit, but it's still sort of coming off the press. Uh, our, our, uh, we've got a few major uh, studies that have just published. We've got one that's just online now for the American psychologists. So you can go online and look at the American psychology article to get uh, more information. But the focus of this is on the autonomy support teaching intervention. Uh, many of you would know that this intervention was developed largely by uh, John Marshall Reed. Uh, it has a long history, but it hasn't previously been applied to bullying per se that much. It also uh, uh, is strongly related to the self determination theory that's a theoretical basis for it. Uh, one of the things that we emphasize was the uh, bystander role, the importance of bystander. There's a, something called the bystander apathy effect. So this says the presence of more passive bystanders actually reduces the likelihood that an individual will help the victim. However, the bystander apathy effect diminishes when the situation is seen as severe. Bystanders know each other and they have shared no, uh, social norms that are violated. And there's a belief that a coordinated effort can, resume, uh, can resolve the emergency uh, situation. Now, these are critical aspects to developing uh, an intervention and harnessing the power of the bystander. In a school-based uh, bully victim episode, bystanders are reluctant to intervene because they fear retaliation. They can become targets of bullying, they'll be socially isolated, and uh, there's good research showing that they, uh, over the long term, they suffer mental health issues, uh, depression, and anxiety. Now, almost all bullying situations have bystander observers. Indeed, bullies seek the attention of bystanders to reinforce their bullying behavior and self perceived importance. So, here we propose these by bystander roles. If left to naturally occurring social processes, that is, with no intervention, student bystanders would be most likely to adapt the roles of bully empowerment or ignore the situation and uh, least likely to adapt to fully disempowerment role. This is because it's socially difficult uh, not to join in to reinforce the bullying in action. And it's even more challenging, even risky, to deter the bully. Furthermore, as we've discussed, uh, bystanders who support, to support victims may experience lots of negative consequences. Yes, bystander roles are critical for tricky to change. Um, so here I give a snapshot of five decades of anti-bullying uh, intervention. The key is that they're disappointing. The classic annual, annual review summary of research, uh, uh, summary of intervention research, individual studies, systematic review, meta-analysis concluded that the results were disappointing. The classic meta-analysis research that we 
done in 2009 and then again in 2019 showed that there were small effect sizes and they actually had declined over time. So we are, so not only are the uh, interventions not very effective, but uh, they're not getting more effective over time. Two studies used uh, appropriate random control trials and those that did had even smaller effect sizes. The true random control trials mostly randomized at the school or class level, but few appropriately controlled for the substantial clustering effects, which would reduce the significant levels substantially. So uh, here's some critical uh, ingredients of our intervention. Our, our random control trial uh, AST interventions to reduce victimization integrates perspectives from a social ecological framework that highlights the critical role of bystanders in classroom climate. The key role of uh, classmate bystanders to the escalation uh, or de-escalation of bully victim episodes and self-determination theory to assist teachers to create a socially cohesive and anti-bullying classroom climate. Classroom climate has been recognized as a potentially important uh, variable in bully reduction intervention, although typically people talk about school climate rather than classroom climate. And this probably is a pretty uh, important distinction, but we'll come back to that and talk about that. Uh, so some of the critical uh, uh, ingredients of our climate is the classroom climate represents the group consensus on what is acceptable and normative. It ranges from supportive, egalitarian, cooperative, caring, to hierarchical, conflictive, and competitive. Supportive climates cultivate a close-knit uh, community and an egalitarian hierarchy that uh, leads to reduction in bullying, intimidation, and victimization. Conflictual climates uh, cultivate social comparisons and the uh, emergence of status-centric social uh, dominance hierarchy, peer-to-peer -peer interactions that fertilize what always referred to as mobbing, including bullying and victimization. Teachers are critical in forming a supportive classroom climate when they uh, engage in our AST uh, uh, network intervention. So here I've tried to capture some of the essence of uh, what the intervention is. The two major components are uh, uh, supporting interest and supporting valuing. And here are some of the key ingredients in each. Uh, this is a, a, a general AST uh, intervention that's been used in lots of different places, but here we're focusing on its effect in terms of building and victimization. Uh, the workshop is really quite a very demanding workshop. So it's an eight hour workshop uh, administered on a couple of different days to teachers. Uh, so uh, there's some intellectual uh, uh, lecturing that's done, but there's also hands on, there's videos, uh, and uh, teachers practice with each other. So it's quite an intensive workshop. Uh, here's, a, here's a quick snapshot of some of the results. Uh, teachers, teachers are implementing intervention uh, as intended, so you can see that uh, the uh, AST uh, climate, uh, in the blue line increases substantially relative to control teachers over time. There's a condition by time interaction uh, in the experimental group compared to the control group, so that uh, there's big gains uh, in the experimental group at, uh, uh, right after the intervention, and those gains are maintained or even enhanced uh, uh, in the follow-up. So this is really quite important, so it's not short-term gains. These aren't long-term gains, but we don't have the long-term follow-up, uh, but these are uh, over a semester, so the intervention. The intervention's total effect on time three victimization is negative and highly significant, an effect size of 0.4, which is really quite remarkable relative to uh, much of the uh, bullying literature. The reduction in pure victimization was mediated through the experimental intervention. Uh, the intervention has significant and indirect effects on time three bystander uh, victim defense. However, there were new additional effects beyond those of time two. The overarching contribution of our 
our study was to demonstrate that intervention had a statistically significant substantial effect on size and size optimization. <coughs> this is a conceptual model of a multi level perspective. So it's doubly latent multi level models. And uh, thus far, our research has focused clearly on the level two, uh, looking at the effects of class average uh, uh, estimates of victimization and bullying and so on and so forth. Um, we will now start to look at our level one interactions with level two. So we're also interested in looking at how generalizable the effects are to individual students and what individual students and student characteristics are associated with the greatest gains. And this could allow us to uh, further our intervention work so that uh, some of the intervention might involve students as well as teachers. Uh, this is a more uh, realistic uh, picture of the intervention uh, that's too complicated to, uh, for mere mortals to understand. Even statisticians have trouble figuring out what all that means. Now, let me uh, uh, finish up with looking at some overarching issues and recommendations. Uh, the first is strong recognition of uh, multiple parallel components of bullying and victimization. It's surprising how few studies systematically look at these different components. Most studies, even when they measure the, even when they have items related to these different measures, focus on global bullying. Uh, something that we haven't talked about is the role of cyberbullying. We didn't measure it, it wasn't part of the PISA study. Uh, it wasn't part of our intervention, so that's a direction for new research. And the issue is whether this is a fourth new component of bullying and victimization or simply a variation on relational bullying. Uh, there's arguments being made in the literature for both. The next is the integration and differentiation of bullying, victimization, and aggression. Uh, uh, these, those, these research literatures need to be brought together. It's just absurd that victimization researchers don't talk to bullying researchers, and neither of them uh, talk to, uh, to uh, the broader area of aggression. Multi level this, uh, perspective is a really critical issue, both in terms of design and statistical models. Uh, the research literature is really lacking in relation to these. Um, the need for longitudinal data and models looking at trajectories and causal ordering. Uh, the cross national generalizability studies, like we've done, looking at the bystander role of the pro anti, uh, the pro victim, pro bullying attitudes, and the juxtaposition with classroom climate and intervention. We feel that these are key variables in the success of our intervention that we're changing those attitudes, uh, changing uh, the classroom climate, and changing those attitudes is what reduces the bullying and victimization. Uh, we've been focusing on the classroom teacher intervention. Most research should look at climate uh, focuses on the whole school. Uh, uh, I think the, it's still, we still need to look at whether there's benefits of looking at the whole school ethos above and beyond the school climate. We aren't looking or aren't arguing that it's only school climate, but we're saying that, that should be the starting point. There is also anecdotal uh, uh, there's antecedent risk factors can inform intervention, uh, but uh, this should only be done in combination with classroom intervention because if you don't change the ethos first, uh, focusing on individual students is likely to be ineffective and might even be counterproductive. So, go ahead and finish up and say thank you for listening to my overly informative, <laughs> information rich uh, presentation. Thank you. Happy to uh, have some questions. Why don't we pull this down so that it's on me and not so. Okay, so questions? Yeah. Uh, so the first section of study, the one point study. Was uh, was done at the beginning, the middle, of the end. Because in the local prison study, it was shown that the victims can come from the other way around. So uh, uh, all of 
pretty much all of our studies we did. And the longitudinal study was over two years. The one they had six time was over uh, two years. Uh, and uh, the curvilinear one that we were looking at, uh, that was over year group rather than over time per se. Uh, uh, we did some work trying to sort out time within person and time between people, uh, uh, but we didn't have enough data to be able to do that fully to look at that. How did you decide which group you were using? Oh, uh, those are uh, factor scores based on the uh, scales. So, uh, so that's uh, relating victim scores and, uh, to time, looking at the victim factors over time, and looking at the bully factors over time. But it's possible to do because some people, like, so maybe we'll be like, you just keep, and then I won't keep them. Yeah, so you would have, uh, you would have a positive score. And uh, certainly, uh, that's why they're positively correlated. Single autonomous school. Yeah. I feel like there's a hierarchy, so hierarchy, and then you have to go jump. Yeah. People that are bullied are definitely going to be bullied. Absolutely. Try to get something. That's an interesting question on who's the victim. I mean, the, the classic answer has always been it's a socially isolated people you get picked on. Uh, but the hierarchy, I think, is really important. And it really is. <laughs> It's a really hard question to answer, other than that everybody's vulnerable. Uh, so, if you say something about who becomes a victim, um, I like this vulnerability idea. Do you think that's kind of very dangerous? Like, I'm situation? Well, the study that we're proposing now, and we're going to have such a large database that we'll be able to uh, uh, try and look at some of the Tim's data is really interesting because it's classroom based. Uh, so, and we've got some uh, information about teaching styles uh, that can kind of get at our autonomy support. But we've also, uh, you know, half a million cases with some, some huge number. That, so, we have enough power to start looking at whether that, uh, uh, whether the effect of the classroom climate. Uh, Moderate is moderated by uh, individual variable. Uh, we're, we're assuming that people that have greater vulnerability will be uh, uh, that the effects of autonomy support will be greater for them than for people that have less vulnerability. Uh, and we want to look at that both with our cross sectional uh, uh, data uh, based on huge sample size. But also look at it in terms of our intervention study. So we, we put in a proposal for a very large intervention study that hopefully will be large enough so that we'll be able to look at uh, uh, the effect of the intervention in relation to individual student characteristics. But this whole notion of vulnerability it gets really tricky because it isn't just, I don't think it's isolated cases uh, in their necessarily but I mean, it's characteristic. So uh, a low SES student necessarily a vulnerable one. And uh, and uh, there's certainly uh, lots of there's some studies that say that high uh, academic achievement students uh, uh, get bullied. And so so this notion of vulnerability uh, gets really tricky, and uh, I don't know how we're going to sort that one out. Certainly, we'll start off by looking at individual student characteristics, but I know it's more complicated than that. And it might also be student characteristics relative to the school that you're in. So maybe if you're low SES in a high SES school, but I think it, you know vulnerability might be related to being different. Particularly in adolescence, I and mean, being different in adolescent uh, ages is is worrisome. Different or low stack? Huh? Different or low stack? I, 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 I think it's a bit more. Just keep low stack. 
Uh, here, here. Let's see a lot of big I got bullied by a girl because I was confident when he was seven. And then by the end of the seven, she tried to be my best friend. She tormented me at the beginning and then totally changed around. A question from Plankton. <laughs> <laughs> a question from Plankton. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I can't use it with that. Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, obviously, we're using self-report, and uh, that's one of the limitations in the research. Uh, uh, and one of, one of the things that's really interesting is that uh, the bullying and victimization people have such a precious definition of bullying. Uh, uh, that it would be almost impossible to meet those criteria with uh, observer uh, ratings. Uh, it, uh, you'd have to have somebody watching the same person over time to look at repeatability. Uh, uh, the observer might not be able to recognize uh, the power imbalance because power imbalance other than physical size and a few obvious things is probably not very uh, clear. Uh, what's the third one? Power and balance, repeatability. I guess intention of harm. Uh, intention of harm probably could be observed. So the whole issue of having external observers is sort of an interesting one. In some respects, we have some control about that because if we ask for both bullying and victimization, we compare uh, the levels uh, uh, of one versus the other, and it gives us some control of that. Uh, but yes, I think the issue of so, uh, having self-report is a serious one. Yeah. Um, so in one of your studies, you were talking about five decades of bullying and how the effect size just got smaller. And I'm making assumptions that cyberbullying probably show up because of the internet. Like, you, you don't have much people on cyberbullying. And uh, I feel like that's yeah, but we're talking about the intervention effect, not the prevalence of bullying. No, but... I mean, now, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what my supposition is. Uh, five decades ago, the research in this area is really poor, but it was a lot worse uh, five decades ago than it is now. And so the studies that had totally inadequate control uh, uh, probably had bigger effect sizes, and those studies aren't getting published anymore. Uh, so there isn't at least a pretense of an experimental design. Uh, so I, I suspect. Okay. Are you saying this is a compound of design? Wouldn't you be able to answer that question carefully? Isn't that answerable? Yes, yeah, so you can just say, look, you control the quality of the design is noted, noted upon it. Yeah, yeah, I suppose you could. I, I haven't done the meta analysis. I mean, that's uh, what's happening to the community, which is trying to define the effect size, even when they control for high quality studies. So. Well, I, I guess the decline in effect sizes is pretty tiny. Uh, I don't think that uh, the big issue is that is that they're getting worse. Uh, I think the big issue is that they're not getting better. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really quite surprising. And, and you know, there's huge efforts and huge amounts of money all over the world trying to solve this problem. They haven't gone about it in a way that Shaming and blaming and personalizing. Oh, you're a bad, you're a bully. I think that sometimes it's a mental virtue signaling because some people are like, well, I'm against bullying. Well, like, <laughs> like, 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 for example, like, oh, I was your tolerant policy at my school, but that also kind of makes it victims yeah. kind of fight back. And they yeah. just don't as well. Yeah, so a lot of times they get happens a lot. Yeah, a lot of times they react and then they get better. No, there's no more new questions.
clumsy reinforce that power. A lot of hurt me because people prepare themselves. No matter what you do, there's no moderator for that. People are always making themselves in the heart. If I ask my son exactly where he's in the heart, he knows what's going to bother him. And so if you don't change the context, that means it's always going to be reinforced. You just say dominate. It's just it's going to dominate your higher than. At least to do it as adults. Right, there's a higher than adults. Yeah. So, yeah. There's ways to go. If you try bullying in an Asheville yoga studio. Oh, there's bullies at Jim Club Church. Wherever they are, definitely. More so. I've been there, you know, just like <laughs> waiting for them to look at me to smile at me, and then like weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, and then eventually getting invited to like a luncheon three years down the track and thinking I won the lottery. Where is that? Fitness first, step well. Oh, do they actually invite a lot? I got a I got a guy. 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 Lower honesty, trustworthy, which is sort of a moral uh, self concept factor. So their self perceptions of themselves are negative in that area. Uh, so, but the issue then is does morality have any role uh, in this? Uh, uh, I guess we would hope that people that are more moral would be less likely to be bullies, but I'm not sure that that's necessarily <laughs> the case. I mean, um, you certainly can see, you can yeah. certainly see some religious groups that are not, uh, that are prone to being bullies, so it may or may not be the case. And then whether or not this has any implications for uh, interactions uh, and interventions, uh, uh, I, I guess our research is suggesting that uh, your moral values are probably going to be hidden. You're not going to uh, talk about them if you're in a context where uh, there's no support for standing up for the bully. Uh, but you know, maybe, maybe in the context of an intervention where we change the classroom climate, maybe some sort of morality training uh, uh, could help. I don't know. What do you think, John Marshall? If morality is the internal, I would assume, of care and beliefs and behaviors. Yeah. Internalization of things. Yeah, I guess, it, I guess it's kind of interesting, kind of hard at that level to differentiate between morality and the pro bully attitudes. It's the kid who speaks up has a high social capital. Like they've got high social capital, they're more likely to stop what's going on. If he's just there, he's watched them around. Well, the interventions that you yeah. need yeah. to target. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. But however popular do number one steps up, all of a sudden everybody's like, yeah, stop doing that. But then you're in my classroom. It's never been said. Aggression is, I've seen, I don't measure everything in my philosophy, but aggression is the most stable variable I have ever seen in any of my studies. I don't know if you guys have seen that. It's very stable. It's like, that's what you love. Yeah. And, and they, uh, that's the uh, yeah. the stability and the longitudinal side of the dot is 0.7. Yeah, that's the key. Yeah. And that's, yeah, that's hot. Mm -hmm. It's higher than instead of personality. It's never personality. personality. It's never 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 personality. And, and like a subset of them will be dark triad. Now maybe we should be, maybe we should be citing a dark triad uh, in our proposal. Yeah. What's a dark triad? Refreshing. Machiavelli, psychopathy, narcissism. Oh, 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 oh. oh. That, that's the one we hope to change school to get away from. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> well, all these kids would be in that. We we measured. It. That's very hard to I mean, there are some questions that are quite Was it uh, the profile stable across the three, or was it differentiated? Uh, this was, 
Because that his measure was sort of it's very free I mean it would be nice. Yeah. Because you could you could easily see differentiation in relation to bullying. Certainly I think there's an I think you can measure the net worthiness. Yeah. Marcy we actually pick narcissism. I think you can send send John Marshall and me uh copy uh, a citation of one of those because we should include this in the book right? that we're doing because uh, we're trying to we're trying to put in a proposal to uh, NHMRC and on so they want it to be much more they want us to have much more clinical uh, input, uh, measures and uh, yeah. mental health measures and they don't really care much about well-being and, uh, and, and a lot of the things that uh, we focus on Okay, well, great. Thank you very much. Uh, if there's any more questions, uh, happy to entertain them. And if not, uh, I look forward to seeing you the first Wednesday of next month for our next keynote. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. 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 -bye.